Okay, my name is Jacob Finley. I'm here with Chris O'Brien, CEO of Full Day. Welcome, Chris. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. We're excited to get get talking today about a day in the life of a technician. Well, Chris, how are you doing? I'm feeling like a technician right now. I have a water pump that I need to do. I'm gonna probably pick, tackle that uh, Friday night. Nice. On a diesel. Water nice. on a diesel aren't fun. I actually have a transmission rebuilt, but nice. I do not have personally the skill set to do it. So thank goodness there are technicians out there that can do it. And uh, I don't know if I just destroyed my credibility for this webinar, but uh, I do know something about this and luckily we have Chris here. <laughs> so here we go. Um, I'm Jacob Finlay, CEO of Full Day. Chris um, is our COO. Uh, this is what we look like. And um, real quick housekeeping, uh, this webinar is being done through GoToWebinar. So over on the right side, you've got a little red arrow you can click on to expand a, a panel. And inside that panel, you can ask us questions. Um, you can do a few other things. And uh, we wanna make sure that you feel like you are free to ask questions. So just testing that out right now, if you could in that question box, tell us where you're calling in from and uh, that'll give you practice there. And uh, we'll see that you guys are able to put the questions in as well. And uh, so you click the little red arrow, it expands it. All right, let's see, let's see them coming in now. Texas, Buffalo, New York. And any questions that you have during the webinar that we don't get to at the end, we will be sure to follow up with uh, after the webinar. So, all right, you see those coming in. All right, thanks guys for putting those in. All right, so jumping in, uh, we've got a lot to cover today. And the, we've done a couple other webinars in the same series, a day in the life of a service manager, day in the life of a parts manager. And uh, what's interesting is when you actually talk to a lot of shops, uh, we were just talking to a gentleman about this yesterday, um, th those aren't necessarily the titles that that are used in various shops. In fact, in a lot of cases, people wear multiple hats. And so um, with the day in the life of the technician, this one's pretty clear cut. We know what a technician is, who, what they do, but once again, they may be wearing multiple hats. So we're gonna zone in on a technician who's doing um, solely technician work, but we'll talk uh, a little bit about people wearing multiple hats as well. Yeah, we, we often find with uh, mobile technicians, as an example, they're out there, a lot of folks, it's been a controversy for years, but you can make a ton of money being, having mobile techs or being mobile tech. And once you become a mobile tech, you're just not preparing, you're not wrenching anymore, you're getting your own parts, you're managing inventory. Managing and, customer relationships. Yep, yep, exactly. So, so this is what we're gonna run through. Uh, this is the agenda. We're gonna talk about clocking in and out, which is important in, in the, in the shops uh, versus you know being a lone wolf tech, how do you get assignments, inspection versus diagnosis, how do you get parts, dealing with the actual repairs, which is what you're hard to do in the first place, right, and what you're the expert at doing, and then dealing with some regulatory requirements around lunch and and breaks and just you know the human need for those, and then um, doing cleanup as well. So we're going to run through that, and uh, before we do, we wanted to launch a quick polling question here, and the question is, do you have uh, mobile technicians in your operation. Do you have mobile technicians? So I'm going to launch this poll. It's going to come up onto the screen. And if you could, uh, just put the response in there and I uh, see those coming in. I'm going to let this go for a, a little bit longer here and then I'll show you the results. 50-50. I got a dollar on 50 that's your, that's your bet. All right, I'm going to close this poll and share the results here. Um, 85-15. Oh my god, percent mobile. There goes my lunch. <laughs> it's it's trending. Uh, it didn't used to be like that. No. This is definitely. Uh, when I started earlier trend. this year. Yeah, it was a lot less. And um, I might be showing my age. Back in the day, you can actually get lunch for a dollar. You know, back you know in school days. So let's jump into this mobile technicians. So for 85 percent of you. Uh, sounds like this is relevant for the, those of you who don't have uh, uh, technicians running mobile. This could be helpful as well. So let's talk about this, Chris. What's, uh, you know, for a mobile tech, we're going to go through, kind of run the gamut of a technician in general, but a mobile tech has got some special kind of use cases. So um, walk us through this, you know, managing inventory on a service truck for any. Yeah. What, what, is that, what does that even mean? Yeah, exactly. You know, what's interesting is like the whole concept. I, I bet many of the folks on the call are, you know, what are they talking about managing inventory on a service truck? You know, just 
the concept in general. We put parts on the truck and they sell, or we load our truck up and and uh, we install those parts as needed, you know, on, on a JIT basis. Yeah. But um, a lot of times there's a ton of stuff that's on a truck, and you'll be amazed at how many how many parts are on there and how much equipment is on a truck. So you could have easily five thousand dollars worth of parts. You could have revolving inventory, and if you don't have a system in place, you know plug the whole bit here, we've got a system in place to manage that as a true inventory asset right, right. with mins and maxes, letting you know how to, when to restock and when not to stock or when you're overstocked. And then obviously if you need a transfer from one truck to another, um, a lot of folks are running blind. They've got service trucks out there. They have no idea what's on the service truck, especially if you're running five, 10, very difficult to manage. And um, you, you know, if you're not, if today if you're struggling doing that and you're not a current customer or you are a current customer, Definitely look at the tools that we have. You can easily add a service truck as a location, as a sublocation, um, where you can uh, basically stock parts and set up reorder points, which is amazing. You know, we always talk about how inventory is kind of like having a pile of cash sitting in your shop, right? And so when you have inventory on a service truck, I this morning I dropped my daughters off at school, it's picture day, and I, I gave them cash for school pictures, right? And there was some change left over. And when I uh, came into the building, it was sitting on the passenger seat of my car. And I was like, oh, no big deal. But then I was like, you know what? Why would I leave cash sitting out in the open uh, in a vehicle? I'm going to grab that. And, uh, and I did, and I came in, right? But how many times do we just leave inventory, which is basically piles of cash sitting in a service truck, uh, not knowing how much of it is there? And uh, is it being protected? Are we holding people accountable? For counting it and, and so forth, right? It's the same thing, right? It's the same concept. I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, it's so critical. I'm thinking about the returns. So some of you might not be uh, thinking about, well, I don't have the use case for inventory, but what about all the cores that are supposed to return from that truck? So right. you've got core charges that could be in the hundreds of dollars, right. thousands of dollars, depending on how many trucks you're repairing at one time. Plus you've got parts sometimes, you know, you're going to go out to do a bulkhead fitting or maybe you're doing some brakes or something or a wheel seal and you've got multiple parts just in case you need a different one or you need a two or um, you, you need to bring two to make sure the right one's there because the truck came with two different models. So in other words, you're basically saying that a service truck is an inventory location like any other inventory location yeah. in the shop. It has to be treated with the same care. Yeah, just another inventory location. It's important to think about it that way. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, what, I mean, we could do a whole webinar on this, but fixing units on site, let's talk about that. So what you know, guys doing? Yeah, I think that uh, something that uh, we often find is you, you probably have a, um, if you got mobile tax, you're either just doing roadside repair. And if you're doing that, it's kind of feast or famine, right? There's there's a bunch of calls that flood in, it's all hours of the night, and it is what it is, and you charge a premium for that. The customers right? are acting on you, and right. you never know when it's going to now, if you've got some business end security, you're leveraging PMs. We always recommend leveraging PMs, which could be as simple as oil changes to inspections. Right. Um, if you're doing that, now you can go to the customer site and actually do those after hours or when the trucks are down or on the weekends, and you can pick on four repairs at one time. So now you're being proactive. Yep. You're deliberately planning out maximizing the use of your time. Exactly. You truck. And you've got your mobile truck out there. We have one, one person in the Midwest who that's all he does is uh, services. He, he's not doing heavy repair or anything like that. He'll do an occasional wheel seal, but for the most part, it's preventative maintenance. One mobile truck generating about 30,000 a month in gross revenue. Yeah. He has no overhead. His mobile truck, I mean, like in retrospect to a shop, he's got no overhead. He's got a couple grand a month. He's got some fuel. But besides that, the rest of that's just coming all, all through. I said, hey, how do you do this? He said, the way I do this, I'm dropping oil on four trucks at a time. Right? I just start on one and I run the gamut, or I start checking it about lights, and I, I literally am going truck to truck to truck. Uh, and you can do that if you are on site. So fixing and repairing on site, especially when you have a yard full of equipment, it's very, very lucrative. And then your customers are ecstatic because you have your uptime. You're always on top of the maintenance. Trucks are always up, they're never down, you're not doing roadside repairs. You're doing it when the trucks are out of commission, exactly. right? You're, you go out there, they just come in the next morning and it's done. Yep. So if you're looking to get your technicians into the 30s in terms of revenue per technician, it's almost a vital part of the equation, right? Yeah. To have a mobile service truck component to it. And it also brings up different things. You can see there's different bullet points we have covered because now that I'm over here and I'm on site and I'm starting to manage other customers, or maybe I'm mobile, I'm doing emergency repair, 
I've got to be able to quickly add a customer on the fly. I've got to be able to add a unit. So I'm going to need more permission than a shop technician. And so if your current software provides that today, great. Otherwise, you, you, you need to have software that allows you to add permissions to technicians or to certain roles that based on the need. Because we, we not, might not want a mobile technician to have all of our revenue, but they need to invoice a customer or they need to have access to uh, edit and add a unit. Or take a payment here and there. Or take a payment, right. yeah. So we can incrementally give them that access, which yep. is critical. And um, it's all a part of being that mobile tech. There's also the 24-7 component, right? So uh, we, we talk about the proactive nature of PMs. And ideally, you're proactively lining up five, six trucks, knocking out the PMs, and getting super productive. But then. Uh, there's a need out there, and, and shops fill this for emergency roadside, uh, maybe coming through like a fleet net or some other kind of a kind of a broker, uh, or people just coming out through your website or Yellow Pages ad. Uh, but talk about that. I mean, what are, what are these technicians dealing with? Yeah, you're basically out there on your own, right? So you're out there on your own. It's two in the morning, three in the morning. There's no parts department, service manager to call. I mean, sure, you can you can wake up your boss, but you need to be able to have the tools to retrieve parts, service on the side of the road, invoice if you need to. A lot of times those are charge accounts. You're not doing 3 a.m. calls for cash tickets. Right. Um, but just uh, in addition to the level of access, it's being able to get the assignment and do all that mobile without the, the paperwork. Yeah. Um, what's, what's amazing is that we, we have some friends that have a uh, shop in Texas, and they used to talk about <clears throat> their mobile tech would be gone for weeks. They wouldn't see them for weeks. And then they just they were like begging him to come in to unload this like telephone book of paperwork right. so that can pay the bills and invoice the customers. Uh, now that's all gone away. Right. You literally can invoice at 3 a.m. if the repairs done at four. You can invoice the customer at four, even if it's a charge account. The idea is the clock starts ticking on the 30-day terms or the 10-day terms. Yeah. So. You know, it's really cool too. Is if you're dealing with, uh, say, it's a third party like a fleet net or whoever, um, and there is an authorization component to this. So it's a 2 a.m. repair, and they want to get the truck up and running, but they also need to know how much it's going to cost, and you need to get an authorization code so you, so the shop is covered, so they're all actually going to get paid for this repair. How does all that get handled? Well, a lot of shops are having to pull someone out of bed, someone from the office or a service manager. Um, to be involved in this repair. So not only is the tech out on the side of the road in the middle of the night, now you're yanking someone out of bed to deal with the authorization process. Happens so much. And um, one of the tools um, that, that we've built in full day is giving the technicians the ability to, uh, well, geez, the parts just got marked up automatically. You can actually give them the access to send the estimate right there and not have to pull anybody out of bed. And uh, the owner's interests are protected. You know, all of that stuff. Huge yeah. benefit. Yeah. Like, and don't you want to sleep through the night? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And even pre-authorized repairs. So if the technician has the uh, ability, you can, or, or through permissions, if your print software does that, obviously we do that in full bay, you can give me permission to pre-authorize repairs. So right. if we're trying to take care of, um, you know, a Freightliner dealership or a gas company or whoever it is, and um, all repairs between, you know, midnight and 6 a.m. are all pre-authorized. Right. Give the tech the permission. Yep. Then you can pre-authorize the repair and move forward. Um, you mentioned something that will give a little teaser for everyone out there. Fleetnet. You mentioned Fleetnet. Everybody out there knows about Fleetnet, ARI, and some of the other uh, uh, third-party builders that are out there. Right. We happen to have a integration come up oh. with Fleetnet uh, that's just about ready to come off the it, shelf. It is ready. It's in testing. Uh, we've been working closely with Fleetnet. We're excited about it. I think it's an integration that has not been done like this before. And um, yeah, we'll we'll have it revealed here pretty quick. This so, there, so anybody yeah. dealing with Fleetnet will love this. Yeah. <laughs> Peace. Much better for you. And you're probably dispatching. If you're dealing with Fleetnet, it's all mobile. Or there's a large yeah, percentage sure. of it. So this ties sure. right into the slide that we're Sure. So a little teaser, it's coming, you're probably another 30 days or so out, but it'll be, it's epic. It's, it's good. Uh, working on some other awesome integrations, uh, interstate phone service being one of them. Yes. Um, all right. Before we move on, I mean, you got to give it to these guys that are mobile technicians that are willing to get out there. Not only do they have the skill set, which is in demand, uh, but they can also handle all this stuff. And, um, you know, these guys keep the country moving. Uh, in so many ways, and uh, anyway, um, and I just realized that I never 
I hid the polling results close. So if you want to see the bullet points, if you love bullet points, there they are, everything we're just talking about. But yeah, mobile technicians are um, play a key role. All right, so with that, moving on, let's go in. So now technicians in the shop. Yep, clocking what, in and out. Yep. So when you're clocking in and out, it seems like a simple slide. We'll, we'll run through this really quick, but um, you've got 10 clocks on the wall. You've got mobile technicians. How do they punch in and out? And so you've got to manage all this different time, and then you're also trying to manage efficiency. Well, how much of their time is spent production versus how much of their time is waiting for me to get work, chasing down parts, et cetera? So let's talk about that. So a uh, technician comes into the shop, and uh, what you see in a lot of shops is a an actual, like old school physical time clock thing on the wall where they, they grab a punch card and they stick it in and it physically punches onto the clock. Or they're using some kind of a software to clock in. But there's usually a line to clock in, it's 7 a.m. or 8 a.m., whatever. Um, they clock in, and now they're making their money, right? Shop's making them. Tech's making money. Shop is not making any money at this point. Okay. And what we ask shops all the time is, you know, um, you know, tell me, tell me what's the average when, when your techs are clocking in in a given week. Your techs are clocking 40 hours a week. How many hours are they actually filling? And usually it's not a pleasant discussion <laughs> because it's, it's not 40, it's significantly less. So, so the mechanics of clocking in and out um, actually it can be a time suck, but then actually knowing what they're working on and getting them on a job can be a challenge. Yeah, it's critical. And I think some people, you know, you might be on the webinar, well, I pay flat rate, I don't care about what you can out. But um, everybody should be concerned about it because how do you know when you need more technicians? So there's more than just punching in and out of work for the day and punching in and out of service orders. It's am I effectively utilizing all the technicians I have? So even if you're paying flat rate, if I've got a bunch of technicians standing around and I'm not feeding them work, I might have the best techs, they're the fastest, they're doing comebacks. But I, can I keep up with my work? Uh, if I'm not keeping up and I've got 50% utilization of my techs, that means I got a bunch of people standing around. Okay, so let's talk about that. What is what is efficiency and what is utilization? What, did, what does that even mean? Yeah, for those of you using full bay, you see this all over the place, but let's define that. What, what does efficiency mean? Yeah, so super basic, basic layman term. Yeah, maybe, so if we invoice, we'll take it this way. If we invoice for a wheel seal, let's say that a wheel seal is invoiced at 2.2 hours, or yeah. two hours, right? Whatever. Okay. So you have to see, we're going to invoice the customer this value. The technician does that in exactly the same value of two hours or 2.2 hours. Okay. That technician has 100% efficiency. Okay, so Every hour we build is the exact number that they worked, so it's 100% equal. So actual hours, when actual hours equal invoiced hours, billed hours, we're 100% efficient. When actual hours are more than invoiced hours, when it takes us more than 2.2 hours, then inefficient so it's now below 100 percent efficient and we're losing money we're not making as money, much money as we should make yep. and our ideal scenario is the technicians have done 100 wheel seals a thousand wheel seals and they do it in 1.5 hours so back to the mobile tech scenario if i've got a mobile tech who's making in the 30s in terms of gross revenue for the shop almost without exception from an efficiency standpoint they're over 100 percent efficient exactly and how are they able to accomplish that they're smart about lining up the PMs and getting them done. And right. we're going mobile because we can need so much more traffic, right? Right. Okay, so um, that's efficiency. What is what is utilization? What is that? Now, mean? utilization, so let's say that we have 10 technicians running the shop, or it's two, it doesn't matter, you know, for your scenario, but we have 10 technicians out in the shop working. Um, and let's just hypothetically say we can barely keep up. There's just more business than we can keep up with. Oh my gosh, right? So we're looking at efficiency first to say, well, how are they performing? Are they at least performing at 100%? Because you, you want to get all your techs at 100%. Once they're at 100%, now your problem becomes, are they just standing around because I'm not feeding them enough work? Right. So now they're just standing around. Maybe they're at the water cooler. Maybe they're talking to each other, doubling up on jobs. I'm not effectively utilizing all my techs 100% of the hours that they're physically here. Okay, so you're telling me you could have a tech who runs at 100% efficiency, but they're standing around half the time. Correct. And that's this is like these two numbers are like the largest issue that shops face right now. They don't have visibility into them, or when they get the visibility, it happened a month later. So you're running the numbers, it's a month later, it's a quarter later, 
and then you're trying to go back and tell tax, well, a month ago this happened, a week ago this happened. Or if somebody starts what I call emotional staffing. They're like, oh, it feels busy and everybody's you know running around crazy. Let's hire more tax. We have to hire more, hire more. Yep. And then pretty soon the cash flow in the business is gone. It's all in payroll and parts and you can't survive. The business is struggling. Because you're going you off the yeah. numbers, right? You should be looking at the numbers real time. You should understand exactly are your tax producing 100% and you want to drive the utilization as close to 100% as possible. You'll never, you'll get into the 90s. You got you meetings, yeah, bathroom yeah. break, you know. Yeah, little right. stuff will come up. But if if you're below 80, you've got a problem. Okay, so and just to be super clear on utilization, when I clock in to work uh, and say I'm clocked in for eight hours a day, utilization is of that eight hours, how much time I, am I actually on a job? Correct. Not related to what if we're actually going to invoice the customer, but how much time am I actually turning wrenches of the eight hours? Correct. So it's possible. I remember uh, when I was working in a shop, we had this rock star tech. He's one of these guys that super good, could get diagnosed really well, and then almost a 0% comeback rate, right? Just really high quality, and uh, he would run at 150% efficiency, right? Um, theoretically, a guy like that could be running at 120% efficiency, and you're super happy, but you don't realize that he can be doing way more if you were just better at feeding him work. And if you're not monitoring utilization, you have no clue, right? unless your gut or some anecdotal evidence that you see, right? And there's also, uh, it, we're not saying like just work everybody like a workforce, right. right? But there's overachievers in every line of work, right? It doesn't matter if you're turning wrenches or you're, you're in uh, computer software, whatever you're in, there's overachievers. Reward the overachievers. If you start exceeding 100%, have a system in place to incentivize them. And we provide some tools in, in previous webinars to help with that. But have incentives to promote overachieving and then measure it before you go to start hiring a bunch of people. On the flip side, um, say it's not a rock star tech, but it's a you know average or maybe below average technician, or the metrics are saying they're below average. So maybe they're coming in at 80% uh, efficiency, and you're like, well, you know, we need to figure out how to get this guy higher. If you're not monitoring efficiency or utilization, you may not realize that he's standing around 50% of the time. And so if you could get him turning wrenches more, like who knows, he's waiting for parts or waiting for authorization or whatever, or he just needs to maybe to whipcraft a little bit, who knows. Um, that you can get him to 100%. You just don't realize that he's uh, getting yanked out of the day and, uh, and uh, you know, a quarter hour of his time is going to be eaten up here and there. Right? Yeah, and so the, the key takeaway here is if you're not measuring this stuff, then you, you need to, right? For a profitable shop, I encourage everyone to check out the uh, profit calculator that we have right on our website. Yep. When you, you can you can mess with uh, uh, parts markups, shop supplies, you mess with any of the numbers out there that everybody tells you to mess with. But as soon as you start changing the uh, build hours and work hours, you'll see an immediate impact to your ROI. And there's nothing like it. So tech efficiency, tech utilization, the only way you're going to do it is measuring time. Yep. And that's the take. Absolutely. So. Clocking in and out of work, man, that seems so boring. But at the end of the day, this is how you run a profitable shop. You got to understand this stuff and what it means. Okay. Yes. Moving on. Getting assignments. Well, there's a segue because you were just talking about assignments, right? Yeah. Like, how do we get to these assignments? Can you imagine there's 10 of us in a shop and we've got to go stand in front of the one service rider holding all the keys to the city to right. give us our work? Right. So there's different methodologies shops use. Obviously, the shops on full day just do it electronically and it pops up on the technician's device, bam, it's done. It's great. But um, other methods will be uh, service manager holds all the jobs in the basket, uh, maybe in paper packets on the desk, right? Maybe you're using a quote unquote computer system, but it still requires you to print it out on paper. So it's not actually paperless. And then uh, you have a line of technicians in the morning. So they all clock into work, they're all making money. Then they go line up in front of the service manager's desk waiting for assignments. I see that all the time. And then another methodology is uh, where the service manager ahead of the shift will dole out the work in packets into a rack. So each technician may have a rack or maybe there's a common rack where they can grab jobs. Um, so that's happening. And you know some of the things that you run into is uh, you know, you always have those technicians that maybe they come in a little early and they sneak the, the really good jobs out of another guy's rack, right? <laughs> that happens a lot. And yeah. um, so that's going on. There's also, uh, you know, it's not just standing in front of the service manager's counter. You're, uh, you know, 
you're having to leave the bay to go talk to your parts manager about parts that you need. So yeah. lines can form there as well. Yeah, I think waste. I'm glad you brought up parts. Parts is a time suck, right? Like that is just, it, 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 you can just hear the vacuum cleaner. We'll talk more about it in a minute, but yeah. Yeah, it's just yeah. waiting all this, all this traffic, that you're, you're basically uh, just bottlenecked with paper and having some sort of system like, like Cool Bay that allows you to instantly deploy, whether you're in the field and you're mobile, you're 20 bays to the right. Um, the last thing you want to do is have us going back and forth physically or having to get on the phone for 20 minutes to talk about where am I supposed to go next. And the rule of thumb is when you, when you, a technician leaves the bay, on average, they're losing a quarter hour for okay. And there's your efficiency. So back to efficiency and utilization. If you don't have an effective way to get them assignments, you're going to be the one costing it. It isn't going to be about the technician, right? right. So the technicians aren't the ones just guilty and crucified all the time. They need an infrastructure to support them, to keep them busy. What about, um, um, I was talking talking to a, a owner of multiple shops yesterday and about a, there was a classic example of a shop in Southern California that's since gone out of business. Um, currently they had some labor issues, but um, the way they approached uh, the assignments was uh, the tradition is to, uh, you know, a truck comes into a bay, you put one technician on it, right? And we actually see this a lot with our customers. I've heard them talking about this. The way the shop did it was they approached it as um, like a pit stop. Like the, the truck comes in and they have like five or six techs converge on it and just knock it out, right? Get everything done. I don't necessarily recommend that. I mean, that, but um, they were able to turn trucks around on average in a large scale operation under 24 hours per truck. Um, and so my point is kind of think outside the box of assignment, like does it really have to be just one technician or do you assign multiple technicians to one job um, and get them working on it at the same time to get the customer's truck back on the road and making the money faster. So with assignments being done by paper, super difficult, super difficult to know who's working on what, doing it electronically, so it just blows open the possibilities of what you can do operationally in your shop. Would I lose my efficiency metrics or my utilization if we assign multiple techs to a job a little bit? Nope. Nope, we track that. Oh, good question. Yeah, Maybe it's, my dollar back. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. All right. So um, talking in and out of SOs, a lot of times people are like, well, if you, if you guys are talking about time, now we've got to go tactically execute this. My, my, my staff is going to go start clicking in, clicking out, clocking in. Um, how, this is overcomplicating the, the technician workflow. Sure. Um, you just display full bay right here. Let's show them how easy it is to clock into work. And folks, imagine I'm on a mobile device, I'm on a tablet, and with my finger, I just reach over and click on a clock in button, and I clock into work. Yeah, so I'm on a laptop here, but I can just as easily, you know, be on a mobile device. Uh, no big deal. It works the same way. Um, but uh, I roll into work. I clock in. Right? It clocks me in, and now I'm making money. The shop isn't. Right, so we have a little warning here. You're not clocked into a service order, but that's done. So, I, and a lot of my location, IP, all that stuff. Single so, click. Yep. With your finger. Um, so now I'm in, and I can see my assignments. Check it out on my tech home. There it is. I can see all the jobs that need to be diagnosed, everything that is authorized to repair, and then anything that's being waited on right now, either parts pricing, authorization, whatever. So, if I want to clock into a job, it's as easy as just you know clicking into one of these things. And then um, this particular job only has one action item, but all I have to do is click onto that action item, and now I'm clocked onto it. It turned green, and you can see up here exactly when I clocked on, what job I'm on, and so forth. And uh, I do my work. It's going to track the uh, the actual time versus what's being invoiced and all that stuff. And I don't have to even say I'm going to move on to another job, right? I don't have to go click on clock out and then go clock into another job. I don't have to do that. If I'm just going to go directly to another job, I can just leave this page without clicking clock out. So I stay clocked in, and I just go into another job. See, it's bold. That indicates that I'm on that job right now. I go into another job, and as soon as I click into that, see right here, I'm still clocked in to the first job. As soon as I click into this thing, it's going to clock me into this, and it's going to clock me out of the previous one. Yeah, super easy. Yep. This is how easy, folks. If you have a tool and a system in place like this, Instant gratification, instant clocking. <laughs> Lots of gratification, man. <laughs> but the and 
the, the cool thing about that is it helps keep utilization as close to 100% as possible. Obviously, yeah. mathematically, you can never get utilization over 100% because you don't really actually work turn wrenches for eight hours in a day of clock in for hours. You want to keep that as close to 100% as possible. So, cool, got that. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's that's the assignments, right? So you can do it the paper method. You can do it the lineup method. Um, there's other tools available. All right, our next polling question. Um, do you charge for diag? Do you charge for diagnosing customer complaints? I'm going to toss this thing up here. 60-40. You think 60-40? Okay, here we go. So far, you're losing. I see the results. Uh, oh, I don't know. It's coming down. Uh -oh. We'll give this a couple more seconds. It's a dollar that everybody helps me get to 60-40. <laughs> I should just stop. All right, I'm gonna close this. My brother's the gambler. I can't make it in Vegas. I can get money in Vegas. I can't walk away with money in Vegas, so I just try not to. Just gotta cut, cut your losses. Uh, all right, here we go. Show show these results here. So it looks like 80% of you say yes. Nice. So 80-20, 80% do charge for diag, 10% no, and then 10% NA. Um, I don't know what the NA is, but. They don't, maybe they don't understand it or. or right, right. Um, I guess we threw it on there as an option, but yeah, 80% uh, yes, awesome. Um, and you, in talking with shops, uh, some of them explicitly charge for diag as a separate charge on the invoice. Some of them bake it in. Um, let me hide these results. So yeah, it's kind of time. interesting too. The traditional dealership, then if we take light automotive or medium duty, you go to a dealership and you're not even going to get seen without a one-hour diag, right? So you get that, right. that concept there of. I'm going to charge you an hour to look at this, and then, oh, by the way, if you decide to get the repairs done, I'll apply that, that charge toward your repair, or if you decide to turn away, you still owe me for the hour of diet. And it's fair. It's a fair exchange of value, especially if you have a skilled technician who you found and who is, it's difficult to find these guys, you're putting them on a job, it's fair for you to charge a customer for their expertise. Uh, you're not running a .org, and uh, whether you bake it into the eventual repair or what, um, there's, I think there's some fear sometimes in shop owners and charging for diet because they don't want to drive away customers. And you might be in a part of the country where that is absolutely true and you're having to operate your business under a, under a kind of a, a shroud of fear and that sucks, but um, that's a rare exception. For the yeah. most part in the US and Canada, there's such a demand for the services of diesel technicians that you can charge for diag and be fairly compensated for that time. And we talk about getting the technician into the 30s in revenue and over 100% um, efficient. If you're not charging for diag, that's an easy way that you can fix it. And on our website, we have an article where it talks about um, how to set your labor rates and how where you set your labor rate, it almost determines who your customers end up being. Like if you go too cheap, you tend to attract customers who only care about cheap labor rates. Whereas you, as you dial up the price, yes, you're going to exclude some customers. You're not going to get them all. But you're, at the same time, you're uh, selecting out customers that you didn't want as customers in the first place anyway. So if you feel like you have to go cheap on Diag, maybe ex and you're not charging, maybe experiment with charging, and you're going to start maybe losing some customers but you make it up with the fact that you're charging the ones that are staying and they're quality customers anyway and appreciate the fact that you are providing true value there in the diag service. Yeah, I think that there's other ways too where the diagnosis uh, portion, it, it, you know, class of dealership again, whether you're at large dealership or, or uh, small, they're also looking for work and it depends on the clientele that they're servicing. So when, when I used to run a private fleet, the last thing I wanted was to say this unit was hard to start, they come in, I used to really get irritated when they go in, they look at the start issue and send the truck back out. Then the guy breaks down uh, just a little bit, maybe an hour, two hours, or even half a day later, 500 miles away, what, however far we made it. Um, and there's you some lose, sort of leak. You lose 40 grand in produce or something. Yeah, there's, there's just a, there's a leak, there's, some, there's a wheel seal failure, it was clear when they left. Um, so I'm a big fan of uh, a pre-trip or a walk around. So as part of this diagnosis, actually doing a walk around the truck, making sure the basic things like lights work and safety devices work, there's nothing dripping out of the vehicle. If yeah. I'm there for some for one repair, at least give me a good 10 minute walk around. And the shop wins too, right? So we find that most shops that actually do procedures and do that diagnostic work, 
they're they're inspecting what, what the truck's here for, but they're also doing some sort of inspection that's generating an upwards of 20% additional revenue. So let's talk about that in the inspection, right? Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. The value of an inspection, obviously federally mandated in the US and Canada has this as well, uh, effectively a DOT inspection um, every year to make sure that the basics of the truck and the trailer are, are functioning up to federal standards, right? You got to do that in state inspections. Uh, talk about that. Like as, as a technician, um, am I just checking a box here or where's the kind of the value add of a technician? Yeah, so not here? all techs are necessarily can operate and do like federal inspections, but and some can get, there's just variations within your certifications, but uh, generally speaking, these uh, inspections, they, they put the shop at in, in harm's way if you're just running through and checking the box, right? So one of the things we find, there's always a form that's involved. There, uh, the technician's credentials have to be signed off on. You have to record that. And then you have to store those records. Because if, if you do this inspection and say things are safe to operate, and then the truck has a fatality you know, a few miles down the road, and it just got inspected by your shop, right. we've got to have some sort of documentation, proof that we have a certified person, and, and what we actually inspected and how, how much we did. Right. So we see a lot of that all done on paper today very hard to wrangle, very hard to manage, um, very difficult. So um, with DOT uh, and state inspections, that's one area you, you just don't want to mess around. But even the bit inspections, a, a form of a state inspection that California imposes where they'll red tag you and they'll shut the shop down if you're doing uh, fake inspections just to generate profit. So you got to check the box on the regulatory stuff, make sure you're certified and, and it's real. We, we just asked about the DIAG, and the reason why we're talking about inspections right now is because there's a real opportunity there if you're going to charge, let's say you're going to charge an hour for DIAG minimum um, to get the tech on this. There's a real opportunity while the tech is going around diagnosing to, there's a synergy opportunity there to say at the same time, perform an inspection of the vehicle, to do a light DOT, like see what's, what's working, what's not working on the vehicle, and um, the customer may not have any idea. Maybe there's the wheel seal. Maybe it came in for something completely different and the wheel seal's leaking. Nobody noticed it. The tech picks it up and therefore your truck did not go down unexpectedly and the tech found that. That is delighting and satisfying the customer beyond anything I can think of if you're preventing the, their trucks from going down. So what an opportunity to add value to the process and help justify charging for diag to perform a checking inspection simultaneously. Yeah. And sometimes people will do the inspection for free. You know, so if you're not charging for DIAG or you'll do this portion of it for free, uh, it's included. You like know, a loss leader. Yeah, right. you might only charge a 30 minute minimum for your diagnosis. Like whether the truck comes in or out, it's a minimum of 30 minutes. Oh, by the way, we do a 15 minute pre, you know, pre trip or a walk around that's you don't pay for just to yeah. make sure your truck is in good shape. Right. Obviously, we're doing two things here to the point you're making is uptime is in, in the in the the main item we're trying to focus on, but uh, we're also looking to upsell, right? So if you're in here, I want to upsell the job as well. I mean, I don't want to gouge customers. We're not looking to rip them off, but there's, it's a win-win really. Right. You find something, it prevents them from going down and it helps us to run an efficient shop. Right? If I'm in here for an oil change and you find a wheel seal leaking, I'm not leaving without the wheel seal getting repaired. Yeah. That is foolish for me to leave with the, with the seals still yeah. leaking. Right. It's actually a good business decision on both sides for the shop right. and for the fleet to get stuff like that taken care of. Yeah. So, and I think, you know, I don't know if we get splashed up fully again. I think we've got a repair in there under unit five that has a diagnosis and show, oh, you're in it right there. So, procedures, doing inspections, walking through how this works. Yeah. So, I'm going to put in the, the mileage that's done. I'm going to verify the bin. <laughs> Just the classic story when I was working in a shop where we replaced the transmission on the wrong truck. Verify the bin. Uh, I believe in that one. Uh, check all engine and you know check all this stuff. So let's say we find a radiator, right? We mark that as a defect. What happens is it drops another complaint onto the service order that automatically. I can, automatically, that I can then go diagnose. Well, let's click it. So there right. it goes, shows on, and then um, let's say everything else is good. So I do I do the check and inspection. I kind of cover the basic bases here, and now on the service order, not only do I have the original thing that this came in for, but I also have defect found during inspection of radiator. And I can go in and diagnose that, recommend the repair, and when we give the customer the diagnosis for the thing it originally came in for, for the low power, they have the opportunity to say yes or no, um, no big deal. Um, it's, uh, it's something that 
the customers appreciate it and uh, could prevent the unit from going down and all these things. They don't have to say yes, but you know, if you never ask, the answer is always no. Right? Well, what's also nice too is I believe we store those as well so that if the truck ever comes back, you can actually go back in and look at, that would be a pending, say I said no to this repair, customer not authorized. We still store that information so that the next time the truck comes back in, you can say, hey, oh, by the way, the last time you were here, you had a leaky radiator. Did you ever get that addressed? Would you like us to go ahead and address it? Exactly. With the service? Another thing you can do is, um, I'll show this. Uh, we've got effectively a DOT uh, inspection loaded here inside full base. So it'll, it'll spin this up and it'll show the technician the procedures for whatever the DOT is, uh, whatever way you're approaching it. And uh, you can document it electronically. You can still do the paper copy on the back end if you want for, for, uh, uh, for other purposes. But same concept, as you're doing the DOT, if you find a defect, it drops it on. You can recommend the correction, tag it, electronic, electronically red tag it essentially as a DOT and give the customer the opportunity to say yes or no, and more likely they're going to say yes because this all makes sense from a business point of view. What's also yeah. kind of nice is uh, we were working with a few different people, and um, this not only from you know, from California bit inspection, which is a it's a little bit more intense than your standard state inspection. So a lot of you have, a, if you're from Texas, have a state inspection in Minnesota. Those inspections are fairly informal, if you will. They're still important. Yeah. But the bid inspection is as close to the DOT federal inspection work here in Canada to receive it. Um, one of the things that uh, we've proven out is that they this electronic format is accepted. We actually print this out. The format is printed with the technician signature, the uh, date and timestamp, the vehicle information, and they'll accept it. You get pulled over and uh, you're going through a scale. Somebody wants to see your documentation, whether it's a any of those inspections, you just write from your phone or your tablet, you can show them the inspection yep. immediately. Whether you're printing a copy for the cat, in case you have a service, either way, or you know, have a cell service, you'll always have this and it's accepted at the federal and the state. At one point, uh, just to keep in mind here, um, the technicians, um, there's a technician squeeze, right? Just like in the transportation world, they can't find drivers, you can't find technicians, it's very difficult to find. And these technicians are running, they are making the shop the money. And you have to make sure that they have the tools in their hands to make the shop money. And uh, when you consider uh, a day in the life of the technician, it's not just a matter of you know these mindless drones that you toss out there to start turning wrenches. They have to have the tools they need to intelligently identify business opportunities for the shop and things that will help the customer and really understand the problems the customer is trying to solve. So um, it's important to respect your technicians enough to empower them to do this kind of thing. And I think that uh, a lot of times we don't treat technicians with the respect that they need, right? And, uh, and trust them to be able to do these kinds of things, to do the inspections and to find things and to recommend and really empathize with the customer. One of the things we built in Full Bay was the ability to, which we've seen in practice work really well, to dedicate a technician to a fleet where they really get to know the, the units of that fleet. And um, and uh, yeah, so inspections help us do that. So we're way behind, Chris. We got to blow, <laughs> blow through here, but there's so much to talk about. Um, on the diagnosis side, so we've got diag and a few other things. Let's uh, let's get through this, and we may have to split this into a, to a separate one. Complaint cost correction. Right. Um, it's important to have the discipline, the three C's of repair, right? The customer presents with a complaint, um, not that they're complaining, but there's some issue. The job of the technician is then to identify the, the root cause of that complaint and then to recommend a correction, right? And um, they need the time to do that. And so, uh, you know, diag, where you're not charging, they tend to be rushed and it's not as quality. So, Chris, if you could talk about what the technician Needs to needs to go through in the diag um, part and and, uh, and why that's so important. Yeah, you know, so um, the three C's. I like the way that, that it's framed. It's you, you've got this complaint from the customer, and as part of this diagnosis, you're just you're basically trying to find out what the root cause is. You might have diagnosis, not the equipment, you might have computer equipment. You might charge computer hookup fees, but effectively, we want to find the root cause. I always like to use a just a, a unit hard to start. It happens all the time, whether it's in cold weather, or hot weather. 
what is actually wrong with it? We don't need to tell the whole story to the customer, but why is it hard to start in the morning? Well, the batteries are bad. That's all we need to let them know. That's the cause, the batteries are bad. Well, what do I recommend? I recommend you replace not one, but both batteries. Um, you replace them in groups. You never want to replace one with a bad cell and have the other one three years old. So you're facing repairs or divorce. Yeah. So you do this recommendation, um, and then the customer gets an opportunity to say yes or no. You know, that we covered on the inspection side. In the diagnosis space, you're just saying, hey, this is what I recommend professionally to repair this job. Here it is, customer. What do you, what say you? Customer agrees to it. We go ahead and do the actual correction. And maybe during the actual correction, as we're processing through diagnostic, we find that in addition to the batteries, the positive cable, or, or the main uh, positive cable that supplies the starter needs replaced. Mm -hmm. So we gotta add another part. And we run through that. Now we've already diagnosed this job, but maybe because that part's added, we reauthorize it. Yep. And uh, so I, in a nutshell, really what you're just trying to do is just encapsulate uh, the, the core items that are um, wrong with the vehicle and have a place to actually put the parts on. You know, like, so I said we needed some batteries, we needed a battery cable. If I had to go to a paper document or walk up to a parts counter, or notify, you know, NAPA or whoever, all manually with phones, there's a much easier way. In the diagnosis process, as an example on Full Bay, you can actually email the vendor right from uh, Full Bay and say, I need this, I need these batteries. Yeah. You can notify your parts team just by dropping the parts on the order. Your own parts department instantly knows as you're diagnosing, hey, this guy needs parts. Yep. Yep. There, the whole concept of, um, there's that line from Groundhog Day where they talk about, uh, you know, putting up Bill Murray in a nice hotel and how you have to keep the talent happy, right? Uh, you really do, the tech's are the talent, you gotta keep the talent happy and, and recognize where the revenue comes from. When the tech is doing the dyad, uh, to the extent that the uh, you know, service manager parts, whatever, is involved in the process in terms of the, like the data flowing to them in real time, they can act on that fast. So as soon as the dyad is done, we get the authorization, we get the parts in, all that stuff has happened. And so the tech's working in a vacuum. So. Um, all right, so same concept with getting parts. I guess we, we pretty much covered that, right? Yeah, and I, what I like about it is during the diag phase, uh, we're supplying the VIN number and year make model straight to the parts department or even the vendor. Um, so as we've collected this information or we're, we're uh, doing the repair, all of that data, when we say, hey, we need batteries for this truck, we're actually submitting all of the information when we put that request in. So you're talking about how we do it in full, right? And which works effectively. Um, a lot of times the technicians, um, so if you're using a paper-based system, you're jotting this down on a piece of paper, right? And so uh, the technician uh, usually doesn't have a runner or anything that can take it from them to the parts manager. So they're leaving their day and they're walking and, you know, there goes a quarter hour of productivity. Um, so, you know, if that's the system that you're based on, just make sure that they get back to the day as soon as they can and um, try to work out a, a, a way that the tech doesn't have to leave as often. Yes. And um, you know, obviously we recommend using full day because it makes so much sense, but um, getting the parts and communicating and all that stuff, um, anything you can do to avoid misordered parts and getting the parts into the hands of the tech as soon as possible so they can keep turning wrenches is, is, is better, so. Yeah, and even another point, if, if I have direct access to inventory, a lot of shops are running where techs have direct access to inventory. If I'm decrementing and consuming inventory off the shelf, you need to know about it. Yeah, you need a system like Colby or a system that automatically decrements inventory, manages the inventory side, all on just adding parts to a service order. Yep. Nobody has to get involved. I'm just putting the parts on as I go. They're auto receiving. Yep. It's great process. You can tell a shop that's running a tight ship on inventory by the look on the face of the parts manager when you walk into the stock room. Like, is this guy going to walk out with something? I experienced that yesterday. We had to reassure, we had to reassure them that no, you're not here to steal. Just looking around. Or if you uh, ask him, uh, it was last time a cycle count, and they, they don't know what you're talking about. Right, yeah, this guy definitely did. Um, yeah. All right. The actual repair. So the actual correction, a lot of times, like you mentioned, is, is different from what was recommended. So once you actually get in there and start pulling things apart, um, what is it actually going to take? So there's a possibility that we have to go back for more authorization, make sure the customer pays the bill at the end. Right? Yeah, one, one of the things I like too, and I, I get, I, I'm, I'm obviously pro full bases. You should have a tool if you don't have one like this, right? Yeah, something. But um, there's some new features if you're an existing customer or if you're a new customer. There's some new features that came out this year that 
basically allow you to um, turn on flags and we've got this repair approved for, let's just say it's $800 for bring to a uh, bank of batteries in this thing. And if it goes over a penny over or you know uh, just slightly over that approved amount, we can actually kick it right back you into can it. Yeah. yeah, you can literally hair trigger or if somebody adds another complaint onto the service order, like during that process, I see the wheel seal leaking and I add that complaint onto the existing service order. It literally will just kick it right into requires authorization. Yep. So there's a couple switches that I think are critical and it's hard if you think about how you're managing your shop today, do you have mechanisms in place that after you've already received your authorization, how do you keep control of that repair and ensure that the final invoice is exactly what that customer agreed to? And it's kind of lame that you have to do that, right? Um, but that's the reality because you want to make sure that the shop gets paid for that repair at the end. You're not having to haircut it. Um, and the reality is with some customer relationships, especially when there's a third party involved, you kind of have to hair trigger a reauthorization and make sure that we're not eating any part of that repair as a shop. Yeah. yeah. Remember, we, all we did was we diagnosed it based on the information we had right. and based on my experience. and. Sometimes everything I said is right, but then there was more. It's, you know, the, the low power issue was multiple issues. And you love the you love the situations where the, the trust level is so high between a shop and its customers where you don't have to deal with stuff like that. Um, but more and more, especially when you're dealing with the third party, um, you know, it's, all, it's like good fences make good neighbors. So just giving a heads up, hey, this is what it's going to be, so on and so forth. Um, can even help maintain that level of trust with the customer. So, um, last point question: uh, Does your state have state regulations around lunch breaks? And um, if this is, uh, if you're in a couple of states that we are very familiar with, the answer is going to be yes. We're going to launch this. Something to be aware of. I mentioned uh, shop in Southern California having gone under for not strictly obeying the law, the labor laws, right? And it's sad to see, um, you know, a situation like that with an owner potentially facing jail time and all that. Geez, it's hard enough to run a shop and have, have to deal with this kind of thing, but it's the business reality that we live in. Um, so we've got the results coming in and I'm gonna blow past displaying the results, but it's essentially, it's essentially 70-30 are saying yes on this. Yeah. And, um, what we want to show you here is more and more with the regulatory environment that we have, you're having to keep track of, did you give your workers a lunch break or did you give them um, a paid break after two hours? And uh, I think we want to show this in the app, right, Chris? Yeah, and I think that what's important here is uh, how do you keep track of it? I think everybody's yeah. struggling with, we, we don't have a mechanism, we're doing the honor system, we're mm -hmm. auto-deducting, we're calling everybody and forcing them out, but there's really no mechanism and they're looking for some sort of solution. And um, you, you probably either A, have a, a, a secondary piece of software or a manual punch system that you're using today. Um, but uh, what's nice is inside of the app, we kind of have considerations for that. And yeah. we go beyond that, right? So it's more than just breaks. We'll, we'll actually let you make custom things like special projects or parts runs. And so we handle this and just be aware of it. I mean, if you're not using full bay, this is kind of a, like public service announcement that you really should be looking into this if you're not already tracking it. But what you can do in full bay is you can say, hey, look, um, I'm going to clock out of the job I'm on, or maybe I'm going to clock um, out onto my lunch break, right? So I do that, and now the system knows that I clocked out of work for lunch. And believe it or not, in some states, on demand, you have to show that when that tech clocked out, or anybody in your shop, they were clocking out for lunch. This gives you the ability to show that um, and then maybe I'm clocking in for training or something else and not necessarily clocking out to a job. You also have to be able to show why you pay certain technicians differently than you pay other technicians. And well, you know, this guy is not as productive or I tend to send them on parts runs or they're in training and so forth. So, so be aware of that. And we built the tools inside Full Bay to not only track that, but report on it as well. And then uh, last thing here before we, before we end is the concept of, um, Kind of the cleanup thing. Chris, you can bounce that. Yeah, you know what's uh, at the end of the day, or as you're kind of wrapping up a job. So it's a, it comes in two fashions, right? As you're wrapping up jobs, you get this cleanup process and tidying everything up. Um, you've got to go back through all of your paperwork if you're on paper, or you've got to go back through your service orders. What's nice is if you are using software, 
you should readily, the technician needs the ability to see and take a glance over of that work before final invoicing if they're the one in charge of it. Or even a shop owner, right? So if I'm the shop owner, I'm the service manager, how do I review all the work before I send it out for invoicing? So there's kind of like this, we're categorizing it as cleanup. Um, we've got a couple of different mechanisms in Full Bay where, you know, one, we, we obviously share it with the technician and let them have another pass at it so they can get all their work done at a yard and then kind of review all their invoices and edit, and, or all their service orders and edit before invoicing. We even have a review step that we mentioned in Core Back and Shop where sometimes before invoicing, all of this work goes over to the shop foreman. They review everything, confirm, then it goes off to the office invoice. So having those layered in steps, I think is always important for kind of that cleanup or that end of day process. And then um, parts returns, we do, you know, this is a big issue in the industry is these core charges and these return parts. If I take parts out of the building and they're not invoiced, they need to come back to the building, right? It's the very basic concept. It's amazing how many parts never come back to the building, core charges, et cetera. But as part of the end of day, you got to have some tools that um, keep track of the returns. And I, I see you're showing uh, full bay right now. Um, we have tools at the tech level and we have tools at the parts level because you could be handling multiple technicians. So at the parts level, we'll actually even share with you which technicians sitting on what parts that are not going to be invoiced today. It's a big deal. And you do an analogy, Jacob, where the amount of money, if I lost $300 worth of return parts, be it cores or whatever, how much do I have to sell to net out the 300 bucks I lost? Well, if you're running a super profitable shop, not as much, but running 10%, you got to be $3,000 worth of work to make up for 300 bucks of parts that walk out the door. So you think, maybe not a big deal, 300 bucks, I do, you know, half a million a month, you know, in, in volume. Well, it doesn't take a lot of those before your, your, your margin is half of what it would have been. Yeah. That's a good point. So as part of cleanup, a lot of folks forget about the return. If you don't have a mechanism today, we built that into full bay to kind of help keep track of that, think about that. If you notice one thing, we're all about making sure it's shop's profitable, and we're constantly thinking about the money here. There's workflow, and there's there, there's money to this, right? You gotta have an ROI. Yep. Never forget about the end of the day, getting those parts back, reviewing your work, and then having an easy way. You know, a lot of times you want to fix something, clean up an invoice, we make it pretty darn easy to just go back in and edit an invoice, delete one, recreate it, reuse the same invoice number. I'm hearing other softwares having folks create phantom invoices, having them split invoicing. And, um, the system you use should be fairly flexible to allow you to make a mistake and then reverse your mistake and, and, and kind of redo uh, your effort. So as part of your end of the day, it's going to happen. It's a reality. And then obviously maybe you Finish wrapping up, clean up your drop. Keep yep. down your tools. Keep your bed clean. I mean, we see a lot of shops, and uh, there seems to be a correlation between uh, shops that keep themselves tidy and shops that are profitable. So you would think that, oh no, I don't have, I don't have the money to spend on uh, having my technicians clean up or cleaning supplies, or maybe even paying someone to sleep the floor or whatever. But uh, the technicians wrapping up the day, finishing it out, cleaning up the day, making it tidy. There's a halo effect to that. Uh, oh, yeah. Hard to put your finger on it, but it's real. They're going to be more profitable keeping your shop clean. Yeah, we ran into a shop I believe there in South Seattle. They uh, settle every end of day. You clean the shop. The whole shop shuts down. You walk into that uh, shop cleanup in 15 minutes of the work shift. That place seems to get cleaned up. At our shop, we had a little scrubber. They had a guy jump on a scrubber and he scrubbed down the floor. Lines painted on the floor where the jacks go, they go back into the spot that seemed like for jacks. And you know, given our conversation earlier about the importance of utilization and efficiency, you'd think that wouldn't be as important. But all right, uh, we're out of time. Uh, real quick, we wanted to ask you would you like us to give you a personal one on one demo of Full Bay? We're going to launch this uh, based on what you've seen. More than happy to do that. Um, so go ahead and respond there. If you're already a customer, thank you. And um, while you're responding there, we want to announce our next webinar will not be in September, it will be in October. And uh, we look forward to doing that. And any other announcements, Chris? And uh, sorry, it took us so much time. We, we don't have time for all the questions that came in. We will follow up on those questions and get back to you guys um, on that. So, Chris, any final words? Yeah, uh, new cycle count feature just went out. Hope everybody loves it. it you know, some of the feedback you all gave. There's also a massive cross-reference tool that's getting ready to deploy. I think it's about a week or two away. 
So look for that. Um, you, you don't have to pay for any of this stuff. Just like as always, you subscribe to Full Bay. We update our software. We build new tech. It's for you. It's to help keep you profitable. We want you guys as profitable as possible, so you can keep us in business. We want to keep you in business, and let's all succeed together. Thanks, guys, for participating in the webinar today. Really appreciate it. And uh, if uh, anybody's going to be at GATS, we will be there in a couple of weeks in Dallas. Um, and uh, many other trade shows to come so please come and uh, meet us check out our facebook page you can see where we're going to be and we'd love to meet you guys in person thank you and uh have a great day Thanks.